All right. If my board members could go ahead and join me out here at the dais. I know we have a few more board members back in the back room. And then uh, we'll get ready to get moving here. I will point out that uh, Larry and myself both just drove from the Coachella Valley after being at the uh, SCAG board meeting out there. So if we can be here at the dais on time, <coughs> folks. <laughs> Chair, would you like me to begin with the housekeeping remarks? Yeah, why don't you go do that, Wayne? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in our hybrid governor board meeting at the South Coast ATMB. We have three formats for participation, in-person, Zoom, and teleconference. In-person attendees must not connect to the Zoom application or teleconference while in the meeting room. And we ask that you silence your communication device to prevent disruptions during the meeting. All participants on Zoom, except for board members and South Coast AQMD staff, will be placed on mute by the host. And you'll not be able to mute or unmute your line manually. For those participating by phone, please call 669-900-6833 and enter the meeting ID 931-286050. This information is also on our agenda. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comment. For those of you in the room, please use an iPad in the lobby area to submit your request to make public comment. Your name will be called when it's your turn to speak. For those on Zoom, if you'd like to make public comment on the Zoom screen, please click on the raise hand button. And for those calling in by phone, you can dial star nine to signal you'd like to comment. Your name or part of your phone number will be called when it's automatically your turn to comment, and the host will unmute your line automatically. Speakers may be limited to a total of three minutes or less for the entirety of the consent and board calendar, and three minutes or less for each remaining agenda item. The chair may provide a shorter length of time depending on the number of requests to be speak, uh, received uh, to allow everyone an opportunity to be heard. A countdown timer will be displayed on the screen uh, for each public comment. And if interpretation is needed, more time will be allotted. For questions or issues related to making a public comment, please call the clerk of the board to 909-396-2500. Please note you can hang up and or leave the Zoom meeting at any time. And as for decorum, masks are recommended but not required for persons in uh, the auditorium. Uh, we do ask that no food or beverages are brought into the auditorium, and that we also ask that uh, speakers please adhere to the speaker time limit and treat others with courtesy, civility, and respect. Failure to do so can result in you might be muted or you being dropped from the meeting. And lastly, please be aware that this video conference meeting is being recorded, and by participating in this meeting hosted by the South Coast AQMD, you agree to authorize recording audio and visual content presented during the live event and consent to subsequent use of the recording in the public domain by the South Coast AQMD. Thank you. And Chair, I turn it back to you. Very good. Looks like we do almost have a quorum here. I'm sure we also have some folks online. So let's go ahead and uh, first off, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Supervisor Rutherford, would you like to go ahead and lead us in the pledge? I think you could join me in honoring our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, can we go ahead and do a roll call? Mayor Cacciotti. Here. Supervisor Doe. Here. Board member Krakow. Here. Supervisor Kuehl. I get a, I'm getting a message from Supervisor Kuehl that she's not getting in and she's the 669 number doesn't seem to be working. She's okay. calling in on a number in 4821. Go ahead and keep on. Okay. Mayor McAllen. Here. Board member Padilla Campos. Board member Padilla Campos, absent. Supervisor Perez. Here. Council member Raman. Council member Raman, absent. 
She's on. We're having trouble moving people oh. over, so um, we may have to do another uh, okay. as we proceed. This is Sheila Kuo. I'm in. Thank you, and I'm here. Okay, Very thank good. you. Uh, Vice Mayor Richardson. Hi, this is Nithya Raman. I'm present. Yeah. Thank you. Vice Mayor Richardson. Absent. Mayor Rodriguez. Here. Supervisor Rutherford. Here. Vice Chair Delgado. Here. And Chair Benoit. Here. We have a quorum. All right, do we have any uh, opening comments? Uh, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with one myself. I'd like to recognize someone that's been with our department for, for 20 years working in the advanced technology department. And this is Matt Miyasato. Now, I was expecting to not have to give this speech. I thought <laughs> it would be a couple chairmen after me or chairwomen after me, um, because I thought Matt would be here for a long time. <laughs> but apparently Matt likes to do some rather extraordinary things and he hasn't been allowed to do those. No, that's not what it is. <laughs> but Matt is leaving us on a cloud. Look at this. He's actually coming down on a, I'm gonna guess some sort of a hoverboard. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Now, if anyone that doesn't know Matt, Matt has always been one of the most fashionably dressed folks in our organization the entire time, and today is no exception, and what an amazing job. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, 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 oh. 99%. Oh, yeah, yeah. Someone captured that vehicle. <laughs> Matt, we need we need you back here to post for pictures, please. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna we're gonna pose with you down here in the dais, but oh my goodness, Matt, what else can I say about you other than it has been amazing to work with you? I think that you've been in this position just about as long as I've been on the board. I think maybe maybe a one year overlap, but it's been always my honor and privilege to work with you. And every time I had any technical question, any device, no matter how outlandish it might be, you were so quick with the answer. And probably my other favorite moment was one day when I was out in the parking lot and uh, I figured out I could get into one of the charging units out there and came up to your office and showed you how I hacked into it. But <laughs> yeah, and it, it's just always been so fun to work with you. And this today is no exception. So I, I'm sure you have some party boards for us and the floor is yours, sir. Uh, getting a little checkup. Thank, Thank you, you Chair Benoit. Um, <clears throat> Let me just uh, say that it's been my deep uh, privilege to work here for almost 20 years. Uh, about half of that has been as a deputy for science and technology dance advancement. Uh, and more recently, uh, it's been probably the greatest honor of my life to serve as the first chief technologist at the largest, most innovative, kick-ash uh, <laughs> Ash, Ash. Air, <laughs> air district, uh, if not in the nation, certainly uh, I would think in the world. I would put up our accomplishments against any other uh, local government agency or, or any organization. So, and in fact, the technology showcase just outside in the parking lot that we hope you will be able to visit uh, today yes. is a testament to uh, the achievements of this board. Um, I, let me just name a few things that this board has done in this agency. The first to uh, support uh, fuel cells and transit buses. We were the first to deploy hydrogen uh, fueling stations with vehicles, hydrogen hybrid Priuses. This was when uh, Secretary Chu said you would need five miracles for hydrogen to succeed. Uh, we did plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, both light duty and heavy duty before they became commercialized. We forced the DOE to do class eight battery electric trucks through congressionally directed funding. Uh, we of course uh, developed near zero natural gas combustion engines. That is the basis by which we submitted our, e our EPA petition to promulgate low NOx standards across the nation. Uh, most successful incentive program throughout the country, well, almost three quarters of a billion dollars to replace older diesel equipment. Uh, Air Quality Sensor Performance Evaluation Center, first in the world. Uh, advanced optical uh, technologies to look at fence line monitoring. And the list can go on and on, but really my point is to say uh, to this board, thank you. Uh, without your leadership, your approval and your guidance, we never would have accomplished those things. I wanna thank the executive officer 
my colleagues on executive staff for collaborating with us. But more importantly, I wanna say thanks to the staff in Science and Technology Advancement. Day in and day out, those are the people that are in the field monitoring, making sure the instruments work to measure the air quality. They are processing, administering contracts and grants. They are doing project management to ensure that uh, things are on time and on budget. Uh, they're considering what projects to bring before this body for approval and support. And I wanna to say to them, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, for always making me look good, well, 98%, 95% of the time making me look good. Um, and I want to tell you, it's going to be okay, right? Uh, I'm leaving you in capable hands. You will always go out there and continue to exceed expectations and to clean the air in the region. Uh, and let me finally just conclude by saying this, German Benoit, um, two DEOs to replace me. Just, <laughs> I was going to mention that, don't I'm worry. Just saying. <laughs> And I really look forward to continuing our, toward our common goal of cleaning the air in the region, transforming transportation to zero emission and sustainable fuels and to make the world a better place for everyone. So I'm not gonna say goodbye, but I will see you on down the hydrogen highway. So thank you. And, and Matt, you need to bring that back up here. We need some photos. <laughs> Here we go. My board colleague joined us down on the. Yes. He wants us to take a picture. Sorry, come on down here. We should carry an extra policy for a little while while Matt's there. <laughs> He's leaving a trail of clouds. Oh, thank you, Matt. What a special moment here. I'm sorry for my board members that weren't here in the room. Um, and again, I'm, I hope you all can see this, but Matt is floating around on a cloud and it's just an amazing thing to see. So thank you, Matt. All right, some other opening comments. Um, both Larry McKellen, myself, uh, and pretty much every other council member, uh, mayor, mayor pro tem, and city manager, we're all out in the Coachella Valley this week for the uh, SCAG uh, Sustainability Conference. Uh, well, it's not Sustainable Conference, but we did win a sustainability award from SCAG, and this was for the Volvo Lights Demonstration Program, and I was uh, honored to accept this on behalf of us. And uh, they did a video that they put up on the screen for us that we had done with uh, the Volvo Lights Group, and uh, they did a great job. And, so it's an amazing project and SCAG wanted to recognize uh, all the effort and energy that's gone into that project and have to bring this back for us. Yep. All right. And then I'd also like to again mention, Matt mentioned it too, right outside in our parking lot here, we have an amazing demonstration program going on. The media has actually shown up. We've actually got KFI here and quite a few other media groups looking at the amazing vehicles that are out here. And 
One I want to highlight is uh, one that Michael Cacciotti uh, went out and demonstrated, which is, and I actually got to talk to their team a couple of times now, the, uh, the Volvo uh, all electric um, tractors and construction yes. equipment. And, you know, I asked them, I, I got here just, just barely on time, uh, but I had just a moment to go out and talk to them because they're right outside our door here. And I said, I want to know, are these in production? Can we buy these today? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, I spent for so long, especially at this particular SCAG conference we just went to, I have seen very neat demonstration units or one-offs or betas. That's not what these pieces of equipment out here are. This is actually purchasable, put a PO down, they'll get it at the, the beginning of this year equipment. So that to me is something that's very important because so often we see things that are into the future. This is happening now. And thank you, Michael, for going out and doing those demonstrations on those and great job. All right, those are my opening comments, colleagues. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would be remiss if I didn't also point out that uh, Metrolink received a sustainability award at, uh, at the SCAG uh, General Assembly also for its uh, renewable fuel program, where uh, all of the, uh, uh, they're using renewable diesel uh, made out of uh, animal fats and plant oils and so on. Uh, no uh, no uh, fossil fuels uh, involved and uh, the entire fleet of locomotives and all of their non-revenue uh, diesel equipment are also using that. So uh, we're uh, the uh, cleanest and safest rail, uh, commuter railroad in the country. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, Wayne, I want to thank you and your staff. We got a complaint earlier this week, late morning, I believe it was Tuesday or Wednesday, from the city of Glendora, from residents complaining about an air sampler, one of our samplers out there in the neighborhood, and just loud noises in the morning. So I emailed uh, Cindy and staff. Within about an hour and a half, staff responded we're going to get out there. Within a couple hours, staff was out there at the site checking. It wasn't too bad. Then they get an email the next morning. Uh, board member, the uh, air sample has been removed, the new one's put in. Everybody's happy. The city assistant city manager for city of Glendora got back. Just incredible quickness, Wayne. I really want to thank you for that. Just just uh, hope every government agency could act so fast. So thank you, your staff, Cindy, and everybody. Wonderful work. Congratulations. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. All right. Any other board member comments? Here on one. Uh, yes, any, Mr. Uh, Chair, hands my, raised? I think my hand was up. Oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Kuehl, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I also wanted to say i um, very grateful to SCAG for another award that it gave uh, to the Clean Power Alliance. Actually, the award was to LA County for initiating the largest um, CCA um, in, the, uh, in the state. Uh, the Clean Power Alliance, which provides green source power to 37 cities and two counties now um, is just chugging along and also I think trying to do its part in cleaning up the air and uh, making certain that we don't pour more pollutants into it in the generation of power. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Yes, there were many great awards out there, but thank you for having that one as well. All right. If not, we'll go ahead and, uh, if there's no other comments, go ahead and go on to Wayne. Wayne, go ahead. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to highlight, as you noted, the tech, dem tech demo showcase is outside, and we certainly hope that all board members can get a chance after the meeting to go take a look. Vendors are very interested in meeting you and talking about all of the accomplishments that all of you made possible. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to update the board on is our air quality management plan. We're actually ready to release the preliminary draft of the 2022 AQMP today. And there are a few things that I wanted to note. One is the appendices, except for one appendix 4A uh, will be released today, but I'm sorry, the other way around. Appendix 4A will be released and the others will be following. And I know uh, we're also working on the briefing papers to accompany the AQMP. Those will also be uh, hopefully coming soon. <clears throat> Uh, but wanted to make sure that we were on track for the AQMP. Um, and for the first time, I'd like to note that we will actually have a standalone separate chapter dedicated to uh, EJ. And uh, the other part that I'd also like to note is that this AQMP will be distributed to all of the people that have currently signed up, uh, pe people that have previously signed up for this as well. 
uh, and it'll be out for a 45 day uh, public comment period, which will close on June 21. So our goal is to be able to um, address those comments uh, next week at the board retreat, which also uh, is going to be held at Michigan. And uh, given the need for public comments and the time necessary to respond, uh, we are pushing back the bringing back of the AQMT to the board for consideration uh, from August to October. Uh, given the time frame to respond to the comments, we'll be able to get uh, those responses out uh, hopefully mid-September, uh, and then, as I said, brought before you in October. Uh, the next milestones, aside from us talking to you about it next week at the board retreat, are the regional workshops that are being planned that will be held throughout the, the region. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to note is that next week at the board retreat, we will be holding the admin and ledge committee meetings on Thursday, I believe at uh, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, respectively. And that concludes my comments, Mr. Chair. Very good. With that, we, I think we're ready to go into general public comment. I do have two people that are signed up here in the room. I'll ask anyone that's online that wishes to speak for general public comment for items that are not on the agenda to go ahead and raise their hands at this time. And I'll go ahead and call down to the microphone, uh, Mitch Anderson or Mish Anderson. Come on down. Yep, right here. Okay. You have three minutes. Right. Okay. Um, Good morning, board members. Uh, my name is Mish Anderson. Um, I'm commenting on your Replace Your Ride program, which provides replacement incentives for income qualified people to scrap their old polluting cars in exchange for a voucher to switch to cleaner transportation. Uh, in theory, it sounds good, but AQMD is failing in its implementation. Uh, I think maybe you should ask your colleague in the cloud suit to come back and fix it. <laughs> um, in July 2020, I submitted my application for Replace Your Ride, and there were three replacement options offered. One, another gas-fueled car. Two, a hybrid or electric car. Or three, a mobility voucher for ride share, car share, van pooling, and public transit. What I really wanted was a zero emission, easy to use, affordable e-bike. I knew the state of California had passed SB 400, which says that e-bikes are eligible for replace your ride programs. So I asked about it and I was told AQMD needed more time to implement it. So I opted for a mobility voucher, which included public transportation and the ride sharing program that I used. But then I found out that Lyft and Uber and all ride sharing had been suddenly removed from the incentive. I agreed to try using my incentive toward a car share service called Zipcar, but Zipcar turned out to not accept the AQMD voucher. This was in May 2021, one year ago. In January, I had connected the Replace Your Ride staff with Active SGV, a local organization which had volunteered to share its expertise in administering e-bike incentives and vendor contracts. So I once again asked about the e-bike option. I was told I could transfer my incentive option to an e-bike option, but it wouldn't be available until the fall of 2021. So I checked last fall, and again this past January, and again last month, nothing. Several weeks ago, I tried again via email and phone. No one on staff has returned my messages. I turned in my old car for this program over a year ago, and I'm still waiting. It's been two years since Replace Your Ride was mandated by state law to offer e-bikes. A local organization has offered technical assistance and a program template. Meanwhile, sales of e-bikes last year overtook the sales of electric cars in the United States. But rather than capitalize on growing public interest in e-bikes, AQMD remains focused on the less equitable, less efficient, less sustainable, less climate-friendly alternative, cars. This option has been roaring along. People who applied for a car at the same time I applied for something other than a car got their incentive a year and a half ago. SCAQMD's Replace Your Ride program has been wildly successful at putting cars on the road, while completely failing to help people switch to the modes that most effectively reduce air pollution and climate change. Tell me, what's it going to take to get SCAQMD to implement the e-bike incentive mandated by the state of California? Thank you. Ben, can I have a response maybe just, I, she's one of my, was one of my constituents and I was at Sierra Madre, the, um, uh, Earth Day show and met some of the council members and they introduced me to Michelle. 
And that, that was a concern. And even the e-bike, uh, we had a open streets event the other day, and there was dozens, several companies with e-bikes there. Yeah. And it sounds like a great, I'm just curious. What... I've got a neighbor that lives next door to me that commutes uh, 10 miles down to Temecula from Wildemar, and he has switched to an e-bike. So Wayne, Wayne, how do we fix this? I know it's not on the agenda, so Bay, you know, tell us when to stop. But quickly, if you can, Wayne, just what's going on and what do we what do we need to change? So my understanding, uh, well, first off, let me apologize if Ms. Anderson had not been contacted by staff. My understanding is that there had been some discussions, but as I understand it, in part, we were waiting for CARB guidance for the grant dispos uh, dispersion. Now, whether or not that has happened, allowed, you know oftentimes that when we're looking at grants, we've got to follow the guidance set forth by CARB. And I don't think that that guidance was yet established, but let me check into it and we will follow up with Ms. Anderson and find out what's going on and get back and resolve this issue. Okay, and staff will make sure we have our number and contact and phone. Yeah. Staff will get with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, next speaker is Luis Garcia. Luis Garcia, are you here in the room? You signed up for public comment in the room? All right. I um, mean, staff could let my laptop into the... Oh, there you go, thank you. Looks like we have uh, Rebecca Overmeyer vespoz is our first uh, commenter. Go ahead, Rebecca. Good morning. Um, my name is Rebecca Overmeyer Velasquez. And I am the coordinator of the Clean Air Coalition of North Whittier and Avocado Heights. You've heard me several times at this board meeting, and I uh, thank you for taking my comments this morning again. Uh, I'm, I'm calling in today to, about the uh, Quimeco and about Quimeco's pending application at AQMD to increase its throughput by 25%. You've heard many times um, the community's concerns about Comeco, and you know the facts. The facts uh, around Comeco are that it's a very bad neighbor. It has been a bad neighbor uh, and a significant non-complier for many, many years. Um, so the facts are really, really clear, um, even just at your agency, right? So you know in 2016, you folks released a health risk assessment for, Come for Comeco because it had again exceeded its arsenic emissions. It continues to do that and you find it 200, uh, in 2020, $600,000, you find Comeco for again, exceeding arsenic and lead emissions on more than one occasion. So I'm not going to repeat the sorry story of Comeco and how bad it is for our communities and how bad it is for public health and how bad it is for our air quality. Um, so I'm here just to remind you folks, kind of like, like I'm your conscience, like Clean Air Coalition is your conscience. <laughs> um, you know, public trust in government, government institutions is at a, a really, a really low, a real low these days. I mean, I can show you, I can, the Pew Research uh, st uh, study just recently, just last year, measured public trust in government. And about 24% of people in the country say that government does what's right just about always or most of the time. That's a very low percentage of people who actually trust. But what's interesting is 87% of the population believe that the government has a responsibility to provide clean air and water and clean water for all of us. So you're, there's a heavy burden on you to do the right thing. And so I'm asking you again to have a clear conscience, to sleep well at night. You will need to act in your capacity to protect the public health and deny Comeco's application to expand. It's the only way you can act to protect us and to sleep well at night, knowing you really are doing your job to protect public health. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next user is um, call on user number one. Hello. Good morning. Hello, My name Roger is George. Brian. Go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me, please? We can. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman and board members. Um, I just heard a comment. Um, my, my name is Ranji George, and 
I am an ex-employee of AQMD's Technology Advancement Office. We were we led the way uh, for zero emission vehicles, electric batteries, and and uh, hydrogen fuel cells. So I just want on that uh, from, on that theme of zero emissions, as the board goes into a retreat and plans for the next year, I do hope the board will re-emphasize the role of hydrogen and the importance hydrogen can play in cleaning up the air, not only cleaning up the air, but to meet the climate change um, uh, challenges. In fact, hydrogen has the potential to make both um, the, I mean, the uh, air pollution and climate change obsolete. It is, it's a very powerful weapon, not only because hydrogen uh, is almost unlimited uh, source uh, of hydrogen is available in seawater. I urge you, board members, if you are in the retreat, to go visit the uh, beaches and look into the sea. That's where your future fuel is going to come. That's where I started. When I went to a beach 30, in, in the 90s, I saw the seawater. That's, uh, that's where the future is. Unlike batteries where the sources are limited, where the supply and the processing is dominated by one single country, namely China, as New York Times has pointed out in a November 2021 article, hydrogen is, cannot be dominated by any one single country. It is that uh, 130 countries have access to seawater, and it can be processed, fuel can be processed. There. All the, right now, batteries have serious ethical concerns of how it is mined, the impacts of lo on the local population, and so on. Tesla has promised to overcome that, and we'll see how it does it. But hydrogen doesn't have, have minimal such concerns. And then, of course, the waste. We are, every meeting you have people from com arguing about Cometco. You know, when I was in AQMD, we had GNB and um, Excite battery. That whole facility uh, created such a uh, controversy in the whole region because of the pollution. A range of pollutants. It was led primarily, but there was a range of pollutants from battery um, uh, processing um, So and the waste. So in the same way, when you have millions of electric batteries coming into the region, you need to confront where will you process the waste? How Thank you, Ranji. Our next speaker is Mr. Stinson. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm here because um, I've been having, going back and forth, back and forth with AQMD staff. I, I would like to kind of ask the governing board, not sure if you guys are, uh, can even answer this, but uh, what, um, if AQMD is a public entity, uh, the, the problem I have is I've been dealing with Chiquita Canyon landfill for over a decade. Um, and just recently, um, I was speaking to a, a member of AQMD, Jack Chang, and talking about inspectors coming out here. And he had told me that, you know, sometimes you guys can't get inspectors out here. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that was said. And I said that, and, you know, I won't say the words here to respect you guys, but I said, that's effing BS. Uh, and he told me, he goes, if you swear again, I'm going to hang up. I go, and I, I told him, I said, I have the right to speak how I feel. I'm upset. I'm angry. Uh, and he said it, that he's not going to hear me uh, if I swear. Um, since then, I have contacted Wayne Nestry multiple times and have been ignored. I've talked to Brian Gilcrest, who or I've uh, said, sent stuff to the legal department, and I've been essentially ignored. Uh, I got a demand letter from an attorney uh, from AQMD from Liebert Cassidy Whitmer, Whitmer, telling me that I'm violating law. I'm violating the law uh, because I use the words, this is effing BS. Um, and that it is not, that you're, you're not allowed to speak that way when, when talking to AQMD. Um, I have, they, they told me that um, 
I have to abide by Wayne Nestery's approved administrative policies and procedures, and that anybody in the public has to abide by that if they want to talk to AQMD. I've um, in in the demand letter from the attorney, it specify specifies that I have to abide by FIHA, which is Fair Employment and Housing Act, which doesn't abide uh, is not for public citizens. Um, it, it states in here that I'm breaking the law. She she's talk, talking in here because I brought up uh, Cohen versus California for free speech. She tried to say that that the your attorney said that that doesn't abide because uh, Cohen said f the draft written on a jacket and I'm using speech and so it's not the same. Which that doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of other stuff here and. Obviously, this is my first time kind of doing this, so I don't really. Thank, Thank you for your, your comments, comments. Um, sir. I'm sorry you're having troubles with your needing to curse, but we ask you to be respectful to our staff. And my understanding is, and my thoughts are that if that's part of your comments, it might be that just being respectful to staff is the, the real issue here. And I would ask you to be respectful to our staff, and I think you would probably get a lot more opportunity to comment and can conversate if you're respectful. So please do that. And, and thank you for being respectful to us as a board today, but I ask you to be respectful to our staff as well. Our next speaker, Andrea, uh, sorry, Quintonos, Quintonese? Quinones. Yes, thank you. Quinones. Uh, good morning. My name is Adriana Quinones. I'm a resident of Hacienda Heights. Um, today, I'm um, here to speak about Chemerco, and I'm asking the governing board to step up and do the right thing. Do not delegate decisions about Chemerco to staff. This is affecting the community of Hacienda Heights, La Puente, Avocado Heights, and North Whittier. Um, some of our loved ones have passed away from cancer. There's many other people that are being affected with health conditions. Um, how many more people need to die for this to become a very important issue? Um, I urge you not to uh, approve the permit for 25% um, increase in production. Um, we are already being affected. Uh, my nephew, um, Joshua Saldana, died of a rare form of cancer at the age of 35. He was an athlete. He was on his way to being a doctor. My sister has cancer. Uh, her neighbor died of cancer. There's um, cats, dogs, horses that are dying of cancer. You know, when is enough enough in order for you to see clearly that you cannot leave this to the staff, but rather take ownership and really represent the people that are being affected by this. Uh, we learned through Excite what we should not be doing. Uh, now it's time for each one of you to really examine if you're truly doing the very best you can to represent us, the people that live in these communities. Uh, Chemerco should not be here. Uh, they have been contaminating our water, oil, soil. I mean, when is enough enough? And again, uh, we have asked for community meetings for we have combined community meetings from AQMD and DTSC and all uh, agencies that represent us. And that has not happened. We need a community meeting. You need to hear us together, make a decision. Do not uh, provide any permits at all until this is resolved. And this company does not belong in this community because again, how many more of us need to die to make this a priority. Um, I, have, I already lost a loved one. Hopefully I will not lose my sister. And uh, I live on the other side of Hacienda Heights. Um, and my family is a very large family. And the people that live on the other side, we don't have any cancer or health issues, but on her side, they do. And she's very close to Chemerco. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, one more time, I'll ask uh, Luis Garcia, are you here in the room? Going once, going twice. All right, that concludes our public comment for items not on the agenda. 
We'll go ahead and go on to the consent and board calendar. Do my board colleagues have any items they wish to pull or items they need to make a disclosure for on the consent calendar? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's Sheila. Go ahead, Sheila. Um, thank you. I wanted to pull item number two. Um, I don't think these term limits are a good idea and wanted to have just a brief discussion. I know the administrative committee approved. So item number two. All right, we'll go ahead and pull item number two. two. Uh, this is a board member. Uh, board member Krakow, go ahead. For agenda items number six and seven, I do not have a financial interest, but I'm required to identify for the record that I'm a board member of the California Air Resources Board, which is involved in these items. Chair, I just have a question. Um, is item number 14 a presentation for us today or? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, so do we, do you wanna pull that or? Yeah, we'll go ahead and take that separately, but if we'll let, go ahead and let the motion go all the way through to item number 22. I'm sorry, 20, 27. 27, excuse yeah. me. So we'll pull that one and do that separately. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, I would like to, if you're doing those all together, I would like to cast a no vote on 22. Um, representing my county, I actually would like to support that legislation. So I have a hard time saying that we should oppose it. Um, I believe there's some emergency jurisdictions for emergency implications for our local jurisdictions that I represent. I wasn't able to attend committee, so I did not get to vote on the committee, but I'll be a no on 22. Very good. We'll recognize that no vote on item number 22. Anyone else? All right, before we take any actions, I do have public comment on, my belief is would be on the consent calendar items. Uh, call on user two, go ahead. Hello, this is Ranji Cho. Sorry, I was trying to comment on item number two. Is that something I can comment on? Yep, yep. go right ahead. Yes, I didn't see the details pertly. I just met, got, uh, saw the headlines. But um, yeah, I think that this would be a very good, this is Ranji George. My name is Ranji George. I just want to say that a two-year term is absolutely essential because we have two years for the president of the country, the highest office in the country. Why shouldn't we have two-year term across the board for every level, local and um, county at, at every level, so that we can have more greater public participation? If the same people continue to hold that office, we'll have a lot more auditoriums named after them, and that's not an issue, but it's just that they uh, become very um, – other people cannot participate. So thank you for that proposal. Thank you. And I actually now recognize that uh, Luis Garcia was actually one to uh, speak to the minutes, I believe. Is Luis Garcia here in the room? This is just an iPad glitch from before. All right. Any other comments on Oh, I see uh, Scott Fredrickson has raised his hand for an item on the consent calendar. Go ahead, Scott. Good morning. I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Scott Fredrickson. Um, Good morning, Chair Benet, Vice Chair Delgado, and board members. My name is Scott Fredrickson, and I'm the Office Chief for Caltrans Division of Environmental Analysis. And I'm here to, to appreciate and thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I'm here to speak on proposed Rule 403.2. Okay, uh, Scott, we'll go ahead and pause you right there. That we're still on the consent calendar, which does not include that, I believe. Mr. I, Chair, that's to set the hearing. Oh, I'm for sorry, Rule just for the set hearing. My apologies, Scott. Please continue. Oh, um, yeah. Again, thank you, thank you uh, for letting giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, uh, let me begin by stating that um, Caltrans, uh, we've been engaging with several South Coast AQMD staff members, especially George Wu, Henry Porzand, and Eugene Kang, discussing Caltrans concerns with proposed Rule 403.2. We appreciate and thank South Coast staff for engaging with us to hear and understand our concerns and for making um, some mutually beneficial revisions to the proposed rule. Um, some of you may know that Caltrans past collaboration with South Coast staff led to Caltrans developing pilot project specifications 
which incorporate many of the requirements of proposed rule 403.2 in construction contracts. In our March 16th letter, we suggested that the proposed rulemaking be delayed to allow Caltrans and South Coast staff to evaluate the outcomes of the pilot projects. And, and while we appreciate the ongoing engagement with South Coast staff to address our concerns, we have a couple major concerns that, that we wanna to mention today. Um, the first being the definition of a large roadway in the proposed rule was revised on March 28th, so that it is only applicable to roadways under Caltrans jurisdiction, interstates and freeways. The previous definition was applicable to all roadways within South Coast jurisdiction, having more than 100,000 vehicles per day. And while we are very concerned that the revised rule only targets Caltrans roadways, um, fugitive dust is not exclusive to interstates and freeways. The, um, the generation of fugitive dust depends on construction practices and the use of dust control measures and is not related to the roadway classification. Since the revised rule only targets Caltrans, we suggest it'd be more appropriate to postpone the rulemaking to allow Caltrans and South Coast staff to evaluate the outcomes of the pilot projects and make revisions to our construction specifications as necessary. In a few minutes, or hopefully in a couple minutes, Caltrans Chief Environmental Engineer, Chyla Chalchuri will be discussing another major concern that the rule 403.2 will inadvertently increase greenhouse gas emissions during construction. Again, I, I really appreciate and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Caudry? Caudry? Good morning, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and Board Members. My name is Shaila Chaudhry, and I'm the Chief Environmental Engineer for Caltrans. I thank you for this opportunity to share Caltrans's concerns with the proposed Rule 403.2. Echoing my colleague Scott Fredrickson's earlier comments, I would like to also express my gratitude to the South Coast staff for the ongoing engagement with Caltrans. While we are thankful for the engagement, we are concerned that the proposed rule only applies to Caltrans roadways. We are also concerned that the proposed rule will have unintended consequences of increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Due to the aggregate recycling restriction within 200 feet of residences, the proposed rule essentially prohibits on-site recycling in urban and suburban areas for Caltrans. The prohibition will increase construction costs and greenhouse gas emissions due to the need to transport material offsite for recycling and then transporting the material back to project sites. Permitting on-site recycling with appropriate dust control measures allows Caltrans to mitigate fugitive dust without increasing greenhouse gas emission and impacting air quality. Additionally, because of the national tracking shortage and environmental approvals needed for the use of private property for recycling, we know that on-site recycling is the most effective way for Caltrans to promote recycling and reduce greenhouse gas. I would also like to emphasize that restrict this restriction discourages recycling of aggregate from concrete and paving material, which is contrary to California Public Resources Code Section 16,000 and 42,700, and it interferes with Caltrans' ability to meet its climate action and environmental stewardship goals. I thank you for allowing me to speak to you today and share Caltrans' concerns with the proposed rule. In light of these concerns, we urge the board to postpone the rulemaking and allow Caltrans and South Coast staff to work together to progressively make improvements to construction practices. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Michael Lewis. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm representing the Construction Industry um, Air Quality Coalition, and I wanted to speak for a moment about the 403.2. I think generally we are uh, happy with the uh, changes that have been made to the 
proposed rule, um, and it's certainly come a long way since its original draft in uh, last July. Um, I do think that, as you've heard from Caltrans, that the the, the distance addition, the, the movement of a, a prohibition of these material from 100 feet to 250 feet, uh, is going to become problematic in this, particularly in the urban environment where. Um, it's, you know, it's important that we continue to use this material and, and recycle it, but if we have to haul it away somewhere and, and process it and then haul it back, um, I think we've def we're defeating the purpose of the, of the rule and that we're, we're just going to add more pollution to the environment rather than, than minimize it. And I, I'm hoping that both before this comes to a hearing, uh, next at your next meeting that staff and Caltrans and the construction industry can get together and see if there aren't some options that might work that would allow for a uh, something closer to the 100 foot uh, rather than the 200 foot uh, distance get, uh, given some particular uh, measures that might uh, mitigate whatever additional concerns there might be about dust from this um, uh, activity. I mean, recognize that all of this is currently governed by Rule 403. Um, and all we're talking about with 403.2 are some additional measures that could be taken to in, in specific circumstances where there is proximity to, to uh, 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 sensitive receptors. And I, I think there ought to be some, some mitigation measures that would allow for closer distances and that we should at least be given the opportunity to think about that because I think, uh, you know, the construction industry deals with a uh, uh, hundred different uh, unexpected occurrences every day on a construction site. So they're used to coming up with solutions that, uh, uh, that work uh, on the fly. So I, I'd like to, I, I'm hoping that, that we can have a little bit of time between now and, uh, your, and the hearing to uh, come up with some options that might allow for certainly a closer distance than the, than the 250 foot ban, which is going to, going to be very problematic in the in the four county region certainly that uh, caltrans is working so thank you for your time thank you any public any other public comments on the consent calendar on those items um i'd like to ask staff to respond but before they do that i'd just like to point out that um respectfully to the caltrans administrator from um i watched a project in my region where material was hauled well outside of the project area, well outside of the EIR zone and into my city, and then grinded without any water, except for a water truck that was on site that was failing to produce any water. And so I respectfully ask that we work together to fix this rule, but we do need to be cautious and aware that we are currently doing these types of things and this material doesn't need to be hauled into a neighborhood to be grinded, it should be closely grinded at the project. And if that's the closest place, then great. I mean, we need to figure out if that's the best option, but not to be taking it into another neighborhood, especially when that project passed four or five other off ramps that didn't have neighborhoods up against them. So that's where this rule of concern is coming from. But I know staff's been working hard to fix some of these issues. I am open to options, but I wanna make sure we get this right. And I wanna make sure more than anything that those neighborhoods get notified when this is gonna happen so that we can avoid those neighborhoods and hopefully just find other opportunities to grind this material. Wayne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would note that this is set hearing and uh, as the board has directed us, we have continued to engage in discussions with these. Uh, some of the changes that you've heard about are things that were actually discussed, uh, not only with Caltrans, but with contractors and other involved parties. I'm going to ask Ian McMillan of our staff who's been leading on this effort to talk about those uh, efforts underway and sort of what our thinking is with regards to some of the things that you've heard, especially with regards to uh, increased greenhouse gases and, and the planning that actually goes into it that we think would actually minimize that. So with that, Ian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we did release a uh, update to the rule uh, uh, just this week uh, in our 30 day package. Uh, that includes, uh, again, some additional edits as we've been working with stakeholders. There's been a lot of change in this rule as we've started from the beginning, so we really appreciate the, the feedback from stakeholders. Uh, one of the changes, for example, that was just most recently made was there was a uh, prohibition on storage piles, uh, material storage piles, uh, and that was a, a hard prohibition within this 100-foot and 250-foot buffer zone. Uh, and that has now been relaxed to allow those piles uh, to be covered and still maintain uh, in that area. So right now, the, the prohibition really is only on crushing and grinding activity itself, where you're getting that 
kind of that most, uh, uh, the highest potential for dust generation. Uh, one of the things that's uh, unique to this rule is that it does allow a little bit of a lag before it starts to allow that long-term planning to occur. Uh, and so that way, Calc parents can look at, and the, the contractors as they go to bid can look at where are their locations where they can maintain just that minimal distance because these are built right up on top of where residences are. Uh, some of these construction zones, and it is very tight areas, but it, to allow that planning, that's the approach that's been taken so far. Uh, and, you know, we're, again, open. This is out for, for comment. We're open to trying to figure out if there are better options, but we are trying to address the concerns that we've heard persistently uh, from many projects through the years. Uh, and so this is trying to provide that minimal protection. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's where it is right now. I think the one other comment, too, is on a concern about relocating activities and that causing an increase in greenhouse gases. Uh, what we have seen from uh, each project is unique. Many projects actually just import all the materials. So there's a lot of travel already happening on many projects just because they're already so tight. Uh, but there are a lot of opportunities uh, uh, in Caltrans right of way if they start doing this planning to look at, well, maybe my project site is normally a certain size, but if I need to have a lay down area, maybe a mile away uh, that has buffer zones built into it, and that can work and it's not necessarily transporting something you know out of state or anything any long distance and so the greenhouse gas impacts uh are, are quite minimal but it provides that protection the air quality protection that we're really looking for for those closest to these construction projects i guess my only other thought on that is there something else we could do when they are within those sensitive areas that would make more sense to still do it there but where we could somehow more effectively control the dust with either video cameras or some other means so that the residents aren't the ones that have to make the calls hundreds of times so that we don't have to, you know, or, or if there's a way to do a, a perimeter fence with a basic spray down water system, I've seen that in some other, I, I just, my thought is, are there other options here so we can accommodate Caltrans, but make sure that we don't have what happened and I've seen happening in cities across our region where dust just continues to come off these grinding operations right up against houses. One of the things I know that we had looked at was the uh, stack height and looking at some of the fencing requirements. And I know those are some of the discussions that we've had, uh, Ian, if you want to elaborate. Uh, sure, on the stack height, uh, uh, we did have some uh, uh, prohibitions on the stack heights, but there's also controls to try to balance that out. Uh, so some of the options that you mentioned, I think that's there is still time if we wanted to go back and, and talk to the stakeholders and see are there other, you know, sort of uh, additional controls uh, that that would make sense. I think that's something that we can explore. And then on that note, Mr. Chair, what I would note is that, as we said, this is still set here and we have time. And we can certainly come back to you in the coming four weeks and let you know where we stand and what we think. And if at that time you want to continue to move it forward or to have us engage in discussions further, we could make a decision at that point. But I would urge you to keep it on the agenda for now to keep the pressure on all parties. Chair, if I might, uh, I think that's a good strategy and certainly open if something can't be resolved in that time, because I think a lot of times uh, there are unintended consequences when you have such big materials in the field, but but we should just keep going and see if something can be resolved. Okay. Yep. Uh, full disclosure, I was a former Caltrans deputy attorney for 10 years, but just on a minor issue, Wayne, <laughs> it, was the, it was the average daily traffic to traffic volume I, ended, I noticed uh, he'd indicated only Caltrans is affected by the 100,000 average daily traffic rule. I know most freeway, I, I mean, busy highways like Huntington Drive is like 40,000 cars, our Fair Oaks is 25,000. Passing your freeway is 85,000 daily traffic. Are there any county highways that are more than 100,000? And why would we exclude a county or another type versus just Caltrans? Uh, part of this, uh, the approach that was originally taken was to be 100,000 uh, vehicles per day. That's a really good break point for the largest roadways versus city and, and typical county highways. Uh, that 100,000, there's very, very few roads anywhere in our jurisdiction that are not freeways. Uh, and the freeways typically are well over 100,000. They're 150, 200, 300,000 vehicles per day versus county roads and city roads are typically 50,000 and less. So the 100,000 was a good break point, but we heard a lot of concern from stakeholders that it can be confusing. And one of the real concerns was don't make the rule confusing because it, you know it's there's a lot of things to think about, right? Uh, and so uh, the approach instead was to change it to using the, the Caltrans classification 
for freeways and expressways. Mm -hmm. And that that is something that everybody recognizes. It doesn't change through time. Roadways are given a set designation and everybody knows. And so that was a, a simple way to get at the same kind of result of trying to get at those most heavily trafficked roadways. And you're certain there's no county highways that go over 100,000 average daily traffic? I'm, I'm sorry. There's no, no county highways or roadways that go over an average daily traffic of 100,000 vehicles per day? Uh, when we were looking at uh, all the roadways around, the, the only one that I think we saw was Wilshire Boulevard for about 100 yards next to the 405 freeway. <laughs> okay. Four, 403 only covers uh, freeways and expressways as currently written. It's a, under the Caltrans designation. It does not cover, uh, yeah, 403.2, apologize. 403, sorry. For rule 403, our existing fugitive dust rule does cover all those other construction projects, whether it's a roadway project or any other project. Rule 403 covers uh, fugitive dust. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, colleagues? Mr. Chair. I'd... Go ahead, Sir Perez. Sure, thank you. And uh, it seems like we're going through a public hearing just now. The only difference <laughs> is that uh, we don't have public opinion. And so the purpose behind a, pu a public hearing is to, is to have a forum, to have this type of yep. discussion where we're able to ask questions, where the public can also uh, have their voices heard. And so I appreciate our vice chair's uh, point that I think we should move forward, our executive director, that we should move forward with the public hearing. Uh, it just makes sense since we're in it already. It's just the only difference would be that the public will be able to have a voice. So uh, I'd rather just move forward with the fact that we're going to set the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also say let's move forward, but let's also maybe bring this back to stationary in the meantime so we can have one more conversation there and further have some dialogue. And if at that point we don't feel we've gotten where we need to be or if we need to put the package back out, we would have to delay at that point. We'll do that. So, All right. Any other board member colleagues? Oops, uh, 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 Mayor Rodriguez, go ahead. Thank you. I, I just wanted to um, express support of your your last comment uh, and to the supervisor's comment about uh, you know opportunity for public comment and having uh, this worked on between when it comes back to us in June and going to committee. Uh, would allow for that open, transparent dialogue and for the public input on whatever issues uh, that were alluded to today and getting into uh, revisiting those topics, as well as I would hope there would be uh, some uh, additional discussions uh, with staff uh, and those uh, who spoke today. So again, would uh, support if that's direction, I, I would uh, support that going back to committee as well and having that uh, interplay of of dialogue happening, both committee and, and staff as, uh, as appropriate. Thank you. Very good. All right, with that, we're going to do, uh, let the set hearing stand, but we'll go ahead and come back to it later. And uh, any other comments on the rest of the consent calendar items, except for item number two and 22, oh no, sorry, 14. If not, I will take a motion on the rest of the balance with the noted no vote on item number 22. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Chair staff second. recommendation. Rack off second. Go ahead and call the roll. Mayor Cacciotti. Yes. yes. Supervisor Doe. Aye. Board member Krakow. Yes. Supervisor Kuehl. Yes. Mayor McCallum. Uh, yes on everything except 22, no. Thank you. Board member Padilla Campos. Board member Padilla Campos, absent. Supervisor Perez. Yes. Council member Raman. Yes. Vice Mayor Richardson, absent. Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. Supervisor Rutherford. Yes, except 22. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. And Chair Benoit? Yes. Motion passes 11 to 0, two absent with two 
no votes on item 22. Very good. Let's go ahead and go on to item number two. Uh, Sheila, do you want a staff report on this or did you want to go ahead and just ask the questions? Uh, well, I think the um, intent is honest and clear. I don't think we need a staff presentation and unless you do, Mr. Chairman. No, no. Well, what, what's your uh, question on the item? Or? Uh, well, I, I, I don't really support the item and I, I wanted to uh, say why, because I think there's something um, almost automatic or kind of knee jerk sometimes about voting for term limits. It just sounds like a good idea. We don't want somebody to be there too long, et cetera. But I think that this is not a good idea for this board at this time. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, I'm on six boards and uh, chair one, and of course on the board of supervisors, and looking at all of our departments and the boards that I'm on, there seems to be um, a feeling that things are kind of in flux, a, a sense of um, kind of a loss of stability. And I think that it's really important to keep a, a kind of a through thread on many of these issues because we are going to find, I think, over the next decade that we have a number of new members uh, maybe every couple of years. Um, there seems to be more instability in our boards and city councils and uh, just, you know, new things happening. So I feel as though we need a little more stability in chairing the board. Uh, I know four years seems like a long time, but um, I just don't think this is a good idea. So I wanted to, instead of just recording a no vote, uh, indicate that um, I think for the sake of stability, we may not want to do this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I, I, I recognize, recognize and, and I, I, I tend to agree with you. I'll, I'll tell you that my thought process on bringing this up though was just that I felt like there was some, quite a few things that as I came into even the vice chair role that had not really compared to every other board that I'm on where we rotate chairs. And, and in most of those boards, it's one year. I know Supervisor Kiel, your board of supervisors, you've been rotating a lot. And, and same with a lot of other chairs of uh, or other organizations. And I think that's too fast, but I also felt like more than four years seems like a long time. So I, I, I wanted to strike a balance and that's why I brought this forward. Uh, we had some pretty good discussion at the admin committee on that. And that's why I brought this forward. But at the same time, it's really is not gonna affect me as much as it's gonna affect my vice chair. But I know you've been supportive of this, so I'd like to hear from you and, if, and see where you're at at this point. Um, I, I felt the same way when I first got on this board. I, there wasn't the sense that the, uh, the chairman's role, chairperson's role rotates. So I think a term limit is healthy and there's, there's no reason why future boards can't amend this. I just think, um, I think what we're proposing is a healthy way to transition the role. And, and if in the future it doesn't work, that doesn't mean that that board can't change it. So I'd like to give this a try, um, just based on kind of the, the recent history of the board. I, I think it's good to put that out there that we will be rotating the role. And if I could ask legal real quickly, this is a board policy, which could be changed at any point by a future board, correct? Exactly, yes. The rest of my colleagues, questions, comments? Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair, one, one thing to, to clarify to also go to Supervisor Kuehl's point, th this wouldn't preclude somebody from being, for example, chair for two two year terms and then being a vice chair and then reverting back um, if right. there was concern about uh, continuous leadership. Right. Supervisor Perez? Yeah, I, I tend to... Uh agree with Supervisor Kuehl on this. Now, I hope that one day, uh, eventually, uh, we do have a, a chairwoman to lead AQMD, and, and I totally feel that our vice chair can do the job. Uh, but I guess my, my question would be, uh, how did we get to two two-year terms versus maybe two four-year terms, right? Uh, in other words, what was the formula? Uh, what are the examples that are out there? Um, 
I just feel that uh, having a chairperson, whoever that may be, uh, at least for, at least at the minimum, if we're going to do term limits, two four-year terms, um, allows us to have consistency, allows us to have institutional knowledge, allows that individual to grow with the organization um, and, and really lead the charge. Uh, I fear that that would get lost. We just had a chairman uh, that was our chairman for what, 30 years? And he did an outstanding job, in my opinion. And uh, he set the stage for us, set the tone. Uh, and I believe that Dr. Burke is an example, a model of, of what a great chair can be with or without term limits. And, it's, and that, in his case, without term limits. Um, so uh, I will be voting no on this as well, uh, because I, I do think that at the minimum, uh, we would need at least a little bit more of an extended period of time for the chair. Uh, so that, that's my, my thought there. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Mr. Chair, with respect to the Supervisor's um, comment, it's the Health and Safety Code uh, statute that limits the term uh, to two years. Um, it doesn't set a cap on how many somebody can be chair for, but each term is limited to two years. But we could modify this to say four terms then, or three, sorry. Yeah, yeah. that would be at the board's discretion, right. two, three, four, five. Okay. Sue Rutherford. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm comfortable with the measure as proposed. Uh, I think two years is a good length for uh, a chairship. It gives someone the opportunity to learn, to get to know the staff, to get to know the position. And then if the board is content, a second two-year term to allow for some stability. Uh, this board is supposed to represent all of Southern California uh, that's in the district. And yet uh, we often see chairs from a particular area. At least our last chair was here for a really long time. I, I adore Dr. Burke. Um, but the chance of my county, for example, ever being chair is precluded if we have someone who sits in that chairmanship beyond a decade, frankly. Um, we really, really need to have some rotation. The stability on this board comes from our appointing or electing authorities putting us here. So there is stability among those of us who serve on the board and a healthy amount of rotation. But the chair is a unique opportunity that really everyone on this board should have the opportunity to experience. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case during my tenure. And I believe that everybody who ends up on this board has the ability to wield the gavel and wield it well. And of all the boards I serve on, frankly, this is the most collegial. This is the one where we actually reason together to solve problems. And uh, that culture is important to maintain. And I, I believe, what I've seen so far from all of you is that whoever sits in that chair will help maintain that culture and that that experience that we're talking about stays on the board regardless of who sits in that center seat. So I thank you for bringing the um, item, Mr. Chair, and I'll be supporting it. All right. Any other comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Nithya, go right ahead. Councilor Roma. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I think this is a, I'm really glad that we're having this discussion. I do want to say that I'm broadly supportive of, of term limits overall. I, I'm open to discussing two versus three terms or the specifics around this. But I do think for institutions, when you know that leadership is going to change, you also, in a sense, um, you're mandating that internal training happens on passing the baton on that leadership. And I think when you don't have term limits in place, that kind of, those kind of internal training processes don't happen as effectively. And, and I do think that that's really important too, that if someone knows that their term is limited, they have to teach someone else the leadership and how to manage the board. Um, I think that that strengthens governance in an organization when more than one person knows how to lead that organization moving forward. So I'm broadly in favor of this, open to, um, you know, discussion around 
how many consecutive two-year terms are in this if needed, but um, I do think that this is a good thing for kind of governance going forward. All right, well, I think with my thought is why don't we go ahead and take a vote on the current proposed, if there's a motion for that. I'll move the item. Second, Cacciotti. We'll go ahead and take a roll call, please. Mayor Cacciotti. Yes. Supervisor Doe. Aye. Board Member Krakow. Yes. Supervisor Kuehl. No. Mayor McAllen. Yes. Board Member Padilla Campos. Absent. Supervisor Perez. No. Council Member Raman. Yes. Vice Mayor Richardson, absent. Mayor Rodriguez. Mayor Rodriguez, absent. I know he's uh, on. The, he's on the. He's on his phone. He's probably trying to unmute. I, I think he might have had to leave early. He texted me that he's on. That he's on his cell phone. So, Carlos, you there? And staff, if you maybe he's still in the waiting room. No, we moved him over. He, he okay. just texted oh, me he's on. And I just saw his name disappear. So, oh, there it is. Do we need to unmute him? I believe. Hi, this is Mayor Rodriguez. I, this is Mayor Rodriguez. Just wanted to see if I could report my vote. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Rutherford? Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. yes. And Chair Benoit? Yes. Motion passes nine to two with two absent. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for the healthy discussion. I do admire our collegiality and ability to work those things out and move forward. So thank you. All right. With that, item number 14, um, I would just like to, before we start, to say how how difficult Mr. Moskowitz makes my IT department in my city their life. Because when I ask for things here, I not only get above and beyond, but it almost happens instantaneously. In fact, I asked somebody to make one minor change to the website during a meeting and before the meeting concluded, it was done. So thank you. And I'm excited. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> hey, I, I have to applaud good efforts. And this is one of them where I, again, our IT department, um, I, I think we talked about a couple of minor changes for the web, for the app and, and it's, they were already in progress. That's my understanding, but good job. So thank you. I appreciate ahead. those comments. Um, and uh, I'm really excited. Uh, to give you a live demo. Um, so good morning, Chair Benoit, Vice Chair Delgado, members of the board. A live demo? A live demo. So just as a former IT director, <laughs> always advised against this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a live demo and, and Murphy's Law has been, uh, been around this morning uh, quite frequently. So uh, right. hopefully everything will go fine. Um, so uh, we've made some really, uh, uh, exciting changes, and I think the public is, and our communities are really going to enjoy them. Two major enhancements that we went live this week with. So if you have the app on your mobile device, please follow along or look at the screen. If you don't have the app, um, there's it's really easy to get. Just go to the Apple Store or to Google Play um, and look up uh, South Coast AQMD. And um, if you are on a mobile device, you can also just go to our website, aqmd.gov. And from your mobile device, it'll automatically pop up and ask you if you want to download the app. So um, if you can see on the screen, um, this is the homepage of our app. And uh, it's on our Places tab at the bottom. We have uh, basically five icons, Places, Map, our 1-800-CUT-SMOG, SCA, QMD, and Settings. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just go to our first major enhancement in our map. So I'm going to click on the map. And by the way, if I'm going too fast, or if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, stop me. Um, so on the map, uh, our first version only had the air quality map. Our second version had, we added fuel for alternative fuel vehicles. You can get driving directions if you have one. And now we've added a third tab. And the third tab at the top says facilities. So I'm gonna click on facilities. And what this does is it connects directly to our find database. So now, we have all the facilities in the region. 
And you see those little bubbles uh, with numbers on them. Those are how many facilities are in those bubbles. So I'm just going to use my fingers and zoom in. And as I zoom in, it'll recalculate and it'll improve the numbers and we can get down to one or a few of them. Or we can just, if you see there's a search bar at the top, we can just type in a place that we're looking for. So I'm gonna type in uh, Frito-Lay because um, it's getting close to lunch and I'm a little hungry. <clears throat> So a free lay pops up and um, there's a little carrot over here. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna put the zoom box there. There's a little carrot next to the Frito-Lay. So it comes up with the address and the website and so on. But if I click on that carrot next to it, uh, what it does now is it pops up uh, the location and all the information that we have about that facility. So now we have these accordions at the bottom, which um, the first one is our equipment list. So if I expand that accordion, we get all the equipment that they have. And of course there's many pages because it's a large facility. Um, and if we look at the number, so I'm just gonna choose the first one where it says 630129, that's actually a hyperlink. So if I click on that, it will go into that specific equipment. And of course, it just takes a little moment and there it is. And so we have information about this and I won't get into too much detail, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So I'm gonna click out of there and close that accordion. And I'm just gonna go, let's say to compliance. Again, uh, we can see all the compliance, the NOVs here. So I'll just click on the top one, the P6380820 on that hyperlink. And then we have information about that. So with that, that is the first major enhancement that we've made to the app, including the find uh, facility information directly on the app. Our second one is going to be on our, our 1-800 cut smog. Now, um, this took a little bit of time because our, um, our aging legacy system is still existing and it took a long time to actually connect to it. But now, um, instead of just being able to call the 1-800 cut smog, we have three icons. We have file a complaint, track status, and call now. So before it was just had call now. But now we've added file a complaint and track status. So you can file a complaint now directly through the app. And I'm gonna show you how. I clicked on file a complaint and there's two tabs at the top. The first one is for your personal information. And the second one is the complaint, uh, the, com the complaint details. So I've already filled out the personal information and you at the bottom you can say, would you like to use the contact information? It'll keep it there. So you don't have to fill it out twice. And I'm gonna click on the second tab which is complaint details. So let's go through a complaint and I'm just gonna put a test one in here. So I'm just gonna choose anything randomly and just gonna say open burning and I'm gonna give a description. I'm just gonna put the word test so that everybody um, everybody back in our office are gonna be fine and not take this seriously. Um, and then I just put the date in there and I'm only gonna fill out the fields that we need to fill out uh, the street address. Again, I'm gonna put in uh, I am, sorry, I am test. And then the city, and again, we have drop downs here. So I can just choose a city if I want to. Don't have to type that in. I don't need to put in a zip code. And then you can actually attach up to two pictures here. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go to my library and I'm gonna choose this picture of my son here and add that to the complaint because obviously there's a lot of destruction he's doing in the background. Um, so- uh, what, what is he burning at home? <laughs> that's actually a- uh, a bubble thing that they had uh, one day. So it was playing in the bubbles. So I'm gonna click on next. And then it gives me a status that says, okay, are you wanna, do you wanna submit this or do you wanna go back? And so you go ahead and just click on submit. And then it gives our standard complaint disclaimer. And I say, I agree. And at this point, you're, the complaint is going into our system, just like any other complaint, either through the phone or through a website. But now it's our mobile. And now you have a complaint number that you can refer to. But instead of having to write that number down, I'm going to click on done. We actually added uh, a, a way to track your complaints on your app and it'll store all of them. So as you can see, I've, I've had all of these test complaints that I've made. So if I click on track status, here they are. And if I wanna see what the status is on each one, I just click on that one. And it says assigned to a inspector for compliance determination. Well, it's not really, but um, we were just testing that. So that is the demo 
of the two new enhancements uh, in the app. And I'm happy to take any questions. I would just like to say that I'm very worried about the chair because he's overly excited <laughs> about <laughs> these enhancements. What can I say? It's I'm not a nerdy guy. It's okay. not a place to file complaints about your fellow board members. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the defense there. Um, you know, I, I've asked for a couple different things over the years, and I just want to tell a quick story. And this is uh, my, I was actually coming home from a board meeting. I had my board assistant, uh, Ruth Ann Taylor Berger, I know is on the call today, in the car with me. And we were driving through Lake Elsinore and we looked off to our right and there was a plume of smoke coming out of the commercial center to our right. But there was not a building on fire. It was actually a, a, a stack. And we thought, what in the world is over there? And I remember trying to get on my laptop and pull up the Find app and trying to figure out what was over there. It was so difficult. She had to call in, call, talk to staff. It took us about three weeks to figure out it's a crematorium and they were having a bad day. Um, to be able to do that now on the app as a passenger in a car, hopefully, um, and to be able to see what are the facilities around you, to be able to move into a neighborhood, but before see what facilities are around you, to be able to know what's around your neighborhood already before you see a plume of smoke. Thank you. And I think the EJ community will thank you. I think all of our all of our communities will thank you because at the end of the day, it's about knowing what's around you and if that's an important thing. And it's a very important thing, piece of the puzzle. I think we've wanted to get to for a long time, but this is above and beyond what I thought we would get to. And then the ability to then submit a complaint this way. Again, thank you. A lot of our cities are finally moving to a similar system, but I, I just so happy we have that here too. And so thank you, Ron, and thank you to the whole team. And I know it's not just you, Ron, and uh, Wayne, I'm sorry, I know we're making his head bigger and we're gonna get in trouble later, but that's just, I think we have to say thank you when it's appropriate. So thank you, Ron. Well, I wanna, um, I wanna thank, uh, of course, uh, Wayne for giving me the opportunity to innovate um, kind of unrestrictedly. Um, and the board to support as well, and also my staff who did uh, most of the heavy lifting. So thank you. And just when I had that complaint the other day from the assistant city manager Glendora, you know, on, on the on the, the daily things we get on the air quality, Wayne, I couldn't quite find that air monitor on there. It was more I saw someone in San Dimas, that's why it was mixed me up. But then when you went to the map here, wow! I'm pull, pulling the map up now. You just showed him literally. It was a, the picture he taken. It's got the houses, everything right there in Glendora, so great map. Thanks. Mr. Chair? Uh, are we gonna be publicizing this in social media, the updates to the app and letting the public know? Absolutely, uh, we've already started with that and we're working on um, uh, a strategy for uh, moving forward with a large uh, marketing for it. Yes. Um, just a quick question. So one, I wanted to let you know that um, EJAG just requested this update, the find location. So they're going to be really excited. Maybe not as excited as our chair, but <laughs> really excited. Um, could we present this at the 617 um, uh, meetings? Yeah, we've actually already talked about um, how we would demonstrate this at those 617 meetings, because this is obviously one of the things that the communities have been asking for, both in terms of how to file these complaints more easily and getting access to more information more easily. So we're actually, I mean, the chair is obviously excited, but we're equally as excited. And uh, when we first saw the demo, it was like, yeah, we got to get to the board right away. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. All right, any other questions or comments? I've lost my online list here. Let me get it back. Al, Al Sattler, you have a comment on this item? Al, you should be able to unmute now. Okay. Um, I, I, this sounds like a great app. Um, I'd like to know whether it also includes provision for emergency notification. Um, you know that we've been very concerned about the issue of hydrogen fluoride in two local refineries. Um, I'd like to know whether it includes provision, whether this would have um, capability for emergency notification. I mean, actually to be strong audible, like what you get with an Amber Alert. Um, and for that matter, there are, there can be other um, local, uh, local emergencies as well as hydrogen fluoride. Um, I know that um, there's, uh, for example, ammonia in some locations that could be a problem. 
chlorine bleach or chlorine. So I, if if it does not already include the capability to um, alert people to um, immediate hazards, I would like to see that added. And for that matter, then if it would have some advice about what to do in the event that somebody is in a region where that emergency, where that um, immediate um, hazard could be, that would be good also. Um, so, so um, again, I, I the, the the issue about emergency notification for hydrogen fluoride in particular has been one that we are very very concerned about. Thank you very much, and thank you um, for having a great app. Otherwise, thank you. And actually, with I'll also put a little um, hint in or tip. Um, um, thank you for the um, fence line monitoring and community air monitoring. Okay, thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, Mr. Stinson, you have three minutes. Go ahead. And if we could put a timer, please. Yes, hi. Um, I'd like to say, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'd, I'd like to say that app is um, probably really great for us out here with the landfill and I'm sure others. Um, I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, but in regards to the app, um, maybe I, I just didn't hear it correctly or not. Will there be communication between the inspectors as well as the person that submits it if they're part of that app? And then um, is there going to be like with AQMD typically uh, a time limit of... Um, that that jots the time that an inspector comes or when a a supervisor has contacted an inspector because many times that we out here in uh, Santa Clarita and Castaic when when we've called um, no inspector uh, ends up coming out or or sometimes there's um, a delay um, you know, AQMD will call us back like three days later and say, oh, sorry, we, we were busy. Will that app kind of control that to say state this is what's happening? Um, and I guess that's pretty much my question on that. And I don't know if this is the right form for that, but I do appreciate the app. I think that would help me at least because um, I've been dealing with you guys for over a decade. So, all right, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? All right, uh, staff, I saw everyone buzzing about. Uh, I think we have some answers for a couple of good questions. So go ahead, Ron, and then we'll go to enforcement. Uh, yes. Oops, there we go. Uh, so uh, first of all, we do have alerts that are in, that's in the app. So if we have any alerts, um, you can go to the SCA QMD button at the bottom and uh, you'll see all the alerts there. And well, also- Hold up, Ron, I think you're demonstrating that, but we're not seeing it on the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Just staff talking. to bring it back sure. so we can see the phone. Just one second. Are you doing that too? I don't want to do. Uh, he's controlling the whole meeting from his phone right there. This is a little <laughs> scary. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. okay. So, um, we're going to go ahead. Uh, so just to go back to the home screen so you know where it's at. At the bottom, you'll see SCA QMD. Uh, you click on that, and we got four tabs there. Um, first one has alerts. So uh, if we have any alerts, we put them here. And as you can see, um, we have three alerts there. We also have show notices as well, and any events that are coming up. That's going to go a little while because um, we have a very full calendar every day of the week, and then also all of our videos. Uh, that are recorded on YouTube as well. You can subscribe to the app. So um, yes, we do show alerts there and uh, we're always working to enhance the app as well. Yeah, I think he's probably referring to alerts that might come from an emergency situation, which would generally would come through a uh, some sort of a synchronous command. So that, you know, if it's an issue in LA County, for instance, we'd be working with LA Fire and they have alert systems where they would push that out to everybody with the phone in, the, in a particular area, not with even a particular app to any emergency. Uh, phone. So I think that's sort of a separate subject that he brought up, but I recognize we probably wouldn't want to put that in the app, um, but to allow that to the, have the regular way. Wayne? Yeah, I was going to 
uh, comment on that, Chair. And to that point, when we do work with Incident Command or Unified Command, we will utilize other alert services. While we certainly believe that what we have is great, at this point, we do have uh, limited numbers of users and not everybody uses our app. I'm sure that will change and we'll have a uh, universal adoption and then the alert system will probably be more effective. But as far as sort of an emergency response, that would be coordinated more through uh, the local responders, the first responders. But we already have an idea. We'll, I'm sure we're going to be bringing something back. So we'll be working on that aspect. But then in regards to the issue of how does the complaint aspect work on file, this I'm going to ask Terrence because the complaint system, it still files the complaint and the complaints still go to our compliance and enforcement team. So Terrence. Thank you. Chair, Vice Chair, uh, members of the board, can you hear me? Oh, uh, classic, uh, you're muted. I'm, I'm out of practice, sorry. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the, the board. Um, right, so this technology will simply be folded into our existing complaint response system. And I can say it's seamless, I just got a note from a staff member about 90 seconds after Ron finished saying, hey, we got the complaint. So I guess they'll be showing up at your house momentarily, Ron. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll also have some, some outreach and education probably to do with members of the community uh, submitting pictures like that. There may be some expectations like, ha, we, we cracked the case and now you can come in and, and you know probably shut them down, quote unquote. And so we're gonna have to work with the community to show you know, what this does is it's like a tip, we can build off of it and so on. Uh, with, with respect to inspector response times, you know, th this isn't. This probably will not impact that. We have a pretty uh, sophisticated system based on our resource limitations. You know, working across our entire jurisdiction, we're always looking for ways to improve and become more efficient, faster. Um, but that's going to be a separate conversation for a different day. Very good. Thank you again, Ron. Keep up the good work, and uh, thank you all of our staff for for folding this new opportunity in for all of us to be more efficient, including the public. So thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? I don't see anybody. We'll go ahead and go on to our public hearing item, or items, sorry. Item number 29, to determine that the proposed amendments to rule 1147 NOx reductions from miscellaneous sources are exempt from CEQA and work on rule 1147. Dr. Krauss, go ahead. I'm doing the mic thing too, okay. It's my own name, I should know better. All right, here we go. Uh, my name is Mike Krause, I'm Assistant Deputy Executive Officer for our Planning and Rules Division. I'm here to present to you our proposed amendments to a Rule 1147. This is seeking nitrogen ox oxygen reductions from miscellaneous sources. Next slide, please. Okay, this rule was first established in, the, in 2008, and it focused on the miscellaneous sources at reclaimed facilities. It affects about 5,300 units in 3,000 3, facilities. Sorry for the delay. Uh, this particular amendment, however, is focused on transitioning the reclaim facilities into the program in coordination with our uh, control measure from 2016 AQMP. And, as, and we also did a BART analysis, which is consistent with requirements of 8617. Next slide, please, Paul. Okay, with regards to public process, this, this process actually happened pre-COVID. So this is one of those rules that we actually had to learn how to transition to our virtual world, not just in our meetings, but also in our site visits. So it was quite uh, quite informative. And I wanna thank, give a shout out to those stakeholders that took the time out there in the sun with their phones, uh, teaching us um, uh, about their uh, about their facilities. We've, uh, we've had multiple meetings with stakeholders and vendors, equipment manufacturers. As typical, our stakeholders involved uh, the regulated industry, uh, government entities, the environment, uh, environmental groups, uh, community groups, and just general members of the public. Next slide, please. Okay, with regards to the emission limits, again, as I said, we went through a full BART analysis. So we look at all the different sets of categories within this rule. We ratcheted down some of those some of those emission limits, their NOx emission limits. For example, with the microturbines, we've set a BART limit at nine. And the other categories set pretty much within the range of 20 to 60 ppm. We also included interim limits. Now, these are the limits to remind you that when facilities leave the reclaim program, until unless we have an interim limit before they comply with the BARCS limits, they would not have a limit. So we wanted to make sure we it, you know, included an interim limit uh, to keep control of those emissions. We also uh, put in uh, some CO, uh, CO limits. You've been seeing this recently in our rules. Uh, this is sort of, sort of to cap and maintain. We are in attainment for CO in our region, but we wanna make sure we maintain that attainment standard. 
And then finally, we included some exempt uh, units, recognizing that some of them are just too small and not cost effective to regulate, and that's at one pound per day. With regards to the compliance schedule, we sort of staggered this. We re recognized that with this particular rule, a number of facilities have just recently changed out their burners. So we were, wanted to recognize the stranded asset that goes along with it and give them a longer time period to change out to meet the bark limits. On the contrary, some of the folks that are out there that have been operating those those uh, those units for a long time and have not been under those limits, they have a shorter time frame in which to comply. Uh, this, this also, also, by, by the way, way, coincides with AB 617 that talks about the highest priority to those uh, units that have not had more recent changes. Okay, next slide, please. With regards to monitoring and reporting, uh, we've added in a schedule now for source testing. We just believe that this is such an important enforcement tool to ensure that the equipment is running properly at the proper limits. So we've added some schedule on there. Frequency tends to be based upon the equipment size. Uh, there was also the question of whether uh, somebody could uh, not have to do a source test while, while units not operating. That makes logical sense. So we've included a provision on there to allow that source test to be delayed until the operation of that equipment comes back online. With regards to SEMS, there is only one continuous emission monitoring system out there. And so we've created some provisions on there to ensure that that is operating appropriately. Next slide, please. So with regards to emission reductions, we're looking at about 1.6 tons per day. This is for this particular uh, rule, that's a 43% reduction in nox nitrogen oxide emissions. Uh, with regards to cost effectiveness, between five to 49,000, so within our threshold range. And then the socioeconomic looked at about 3 million per year uh, across aggregate across the 3,000 affected facilities. Next slide, please. So we have been working again closely with stakeholders, responding to their comments and issues. Currently, we're not aware of any more key issues remaining. We would like to recommend you to determine that this particular uh, rule amendment is uh, exempt from the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, and to amend our rule 1147. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. Any board member comments or questions before public comment? I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Do we have any members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Not seeing anyone on my list here in the room or online. Not seeing anyone running down here. Mr. Chair, I'll move the approval of the item. I haven't closed the public oh, hearing. Oh, sorry. I thought you were about to do it. <laughs> I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. I'll take a motion. I'll move approval of the item. Sorry. All right. Second. Any other board member comments or questions? If not, uh, would the clerk go ahead and call the roll? Mayor Cacciotti? Yes. Supervisor Doe? Aye. Board member Krakow? Yes. Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Kuehl. Absent. Mayor McAllen. Yes. Board member Padilla Campos. Absent. Supervisor Perez. Aye. Council member Rahman. Yes. Vice Mayor Richardson, absent. Mayor Rodriguez, Mayor Rodriguez, absent. Supervisor Rutherford, yes. Vice Chair Delgado, yes. And Chair Benoit, yes. Oh, Supervisor Kuehl, go ahead. I, I was, I was somehow Thank muted you. again. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes 11 0, three members absent. Very good. Thank we'll you very much. On. Thank you. We're going to go on to our next public hearing item, uh, item number 30 determine the proposed rule amendments to regulation three fees and rule uh, 1480. Sujata, go ahead. Good morning, Chair Benoit and members of the board. Jatha Jain, Chief Financial Excuse Officer. Excuse me for one moment, please. A motion passes 10, oh. zero, no, three, uh, three absent. Thank you. No problem. Sorry. On item 29. Sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Sujata. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. Um, this is Sujata Jain, Chief Financial Officer. This is our presentation of the budget and goals and priority objectives for fiscal year 22-23. Next slide, please. 
So in this, we'll go over uh, the goals and uh, priority objectives, the general fund budget for the fiscal year 2023, and staff's proposals to adopt the budget, uh, propose, uh, proposed amendments to Reg 3, and uh, proposed uh, amendments to Rule 1480. Next slide, please. So this is um, uh, this has all been discussed at the government board uh, budget workshop, but I'll go over it uh, briefly again. This is the uh, first section is the goals and priority objectives, and uh, we have our mission statement, three goals, and 20 priority objectives. Next slide, please. Um, the mission statement is still the same as last year. Next slide, please. And the three goals um, are the same. However, we have 20 priority objectives this time. Next slide, please. So this is the clean version of our uh, goal one. And uh, we have made all the changes and to what was discussed at the budget workshop. And there were some changes to the first three uh, priority objectives. And so uh, we we're showing you uh, what was discussed and the changes that uh, staff had proposed. And uh, so those are incorporated here. Next slide, please. And the next four, there were no changes to these goals and priority objectives. Next slide, please. And the last uh, one, there wasn't any change, but there was another goal and priority objective to this uh, particular goal, which had to do with the main studies. And since the main studies has been published, we took that out. Next slide, please. Uh, goal two has five priority objectives, and there were uh, really no changes to those from the prior year. Next slide, please. Um, goal three has seven priority objectives, and there were just slight changes to um, number three, where well, well maintain well informed staff. We uh, made a slight change. And then, next slide, please, to uh, number six. Also, we made a slight change that had to do with the uh, employee resource groups. Uh, and it used to be called uh, employee affinity groups. And there was a slight change to that. And so uh, that pretty much uh, concludes the goals and priority objectives section. And I'll get into the budget section now. Next slide, please. So um, this is the general fund budget, and um, uh, this is a balanced budget at $189.2 million. Our last year budget, which, was, uh, which, which is the current fiscal year that we are in, 21-22, was also a balanced budget at $179.9 million. There were some amendments throughout the year, which were board approved, and we estimate to use $1.7 million out of our reserves as we end the fiscal year. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, I apologize, is a busy slide, uh, but in a nutshell, it is uh, that we are adding 11 positions in this uh, new budget. And uh, out of that, eight positions are revenue offset positions. So the impact is about four, uh, four positions on the new budget. Next slide, please. So this, uh, uh, this slide is our five-year projection. And in this, we are basically showing that we are uh, bringing a balanced budget in fiscal year 2023. We are bringing that balanced budget at a lower vacancy rate at 11% compared to 13% in the last uh, fiscal year. And um, also we um, have uh, factored in the uh, CPI, CPI that came in at 6.5%. So that has been factored into the revenue increase. And um, uh, I think, um, yes. And, and also, lastly, um, the reserves are looking OK. And uh, in the fifth year, they are above the governing board's policy. So with that, I conclude the presentation. And I'll hand it back, hand it to Ian um, on the uh, amendments to uh, Reg 3 and uh, proposed amendments to 1480. And then I'll come back and conclude on the last slide. Unless uh, you have some questions, I can take them now at the end. Uh, so, Jada, one quick question on the, the vacancy rate. I re recognize this is the goal. What are we currently at on the vacancy rate? And are we still reporting that out anywhere else? Or 
that was part of the report we've been getting uh, that we didn't sort of stopped recently, but I recognize that's a pretty, that's a very important metric one to still keep track of. Yeah, and I know Board Member Krakow had also asked about that. We actually monitor the vacancy rate on a weekly basis. And what uh, we said we would do is we would actually report that uh, in the weekly report. So I can tell you that, for instance, the, the current vacancy rate is roughly 19%. Um, and the budget also has the goal, as you can see here, of 11%. Right. So we have it there, but I think that the weekly reporting will be a much more uh, reflective of real-time conditions within the organization. So I thought that would suffice, and I hope that uh, satisfies your concerns. Maybe in that weekly email report, put that like a like a tracker almost at the top of that, mm -hmm. just a bold highlight number, you know, so we can first thing you see when you open that email. We can do that. Susan okay. loves putting tables together. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't need to be a big table, just yeah. the number. Yeah, I think but part of thank you, uh, the chair and executive officer Nastri. I think part of this exercise is it, it, probably many reasons for doing this, but one is, is to identify what our goals and priorities are as an agency, and the other is to hold ourselves accountable by, by tracking it. So uh, I do appreciate that we're going to be tracking this vacancy issue uh, regularly, but um, just want to also make sure that we all have the common goal and priority with all the things we're doing uh, of getting this vacancy rate down. That's right. We share that goal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to jot in, in the section on the uh, changes in fund balance and unreserved fund balance, I noticed in 24, 25, 25, 26, it's kind of a big drop, 6.3 million and 7.4 million. What is it? What accounts for that? So uh, thank you for that question, Mayor Kachuri. Um, So we bring a balanced budget, like including fiscal year 22, 23, and the past four years, at least we've been bringing a balanced budget. So. Um, what we are showing here are, and, and our reserves are okay, they're above the 20%. So if there was a need, for example, like something for the building or one time or infrastructure for IT or some, some stuff like that, we project it out over here uh, and we, we will bring it to the board either in a mid-year or as the need uh, occurs to you know pull that money out of the reserve. So, um, you know, those are some needs that are projected out, uh, maybe building, maybe transfer some money to the debt service fund to build a reserve for, uh, you know, a pension liability, that kind of stuff. So, we're showing that there. Good. Sujata, I know one of the big items on that future stuff for a long time was the elevators. Have those all been done now? And I think we're on to some other things in the building, yes. right? Yes, uh, the elevators are done, but there are other things. Uh, related to the building, like air handlers and all those are expensive things also. Yeah. Any other board member comments or questions? All right, we're going to go to public comment, open public oh, hearing. Oh, 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 there's more presentation, I'm sorry. There's more presentation, sorry. I'll hand it over to Ian. Go ahead, Ian, thank you. Good morning, I could be brief, and then we've got through the interesting parts, we'll get to the board parts pretty quickly. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so just talk you know, briefly about some of the uh, rule amendments. Uh, so we do have the automatic uh, CPI increase that Sujata already mentioned. We have some targeted proposals with uh, some limited fee increases, one on 1180 rule uh, uh, refinery uh, air monitoring. Uh, I'll touch, touch on that in a little bit. Uh, most of the rest of this is all really minor uh, amendments. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's two uh, reassessments we did this year, uh, relatively larger reassessments that we don't typically do. Uh, one is on uh, Rule 1180, where we look at uh, are we collecting enough fees or required to, uh, by health and safety code, required to collect enough fees to offset all the costs of that program. We are currently running a, a slight surplus, but that is mainly because we were ramping that program. The program is now ramped up and, and cruising. And what we're saying is we're going to have a bill visit very soon. So we're just going to be uh, raising the fees just enough to cover that uh, uh, that deficit over the next three years, we'll be phasing that in over a three year period. Uh, the other reassessment we looked at was for our toxic fees. We had a relatively large amendment in 2019 on those toxic fees. Uh, we um, uh, uh, took a look uh, at the, uh, the fee levels uh, to see if they're uh, still something that makes sense. Uh, what we have uh, been proposing is because CARB has a new regulation coming in called the Criteria of Toxic Reporting Regulation that will be uh, requiring a lot more facilities to be reporting their emissions to us. That's going to be started this year. 
uh, report it next year, paying fees next year. We want to see how that shakes out first because that's going to be thousands of facilities, paying fees, reporting emissions. We want to see the results of that before we uh, uh, consider our potential amendments. Thanks. Uh, we did hear a little bit of feedback from 1180, a lot of uh, questions back and forth with fourth industry about the, the fee amendment here. Uh, the, the one remaining uh, request that we have heard is to align the different assessments. There's a, a monitoring network assessment that's on a different cycle than the fee, effect, the fee amendment uh, reassessment. And so we uh, plan to align those in the next assessment. Next slide. That's it for me. Thanks. Just a quick question, Chair. Yep. Right, you have. Uh, I'm not sure if this is from uh, Mr. McMillan or other members on staff. Uh, this CTR, the toxics reporting. Can you just explain in uh, you know more or less plain English for the board what that is and uh, what the uh, what we're expecting for additional facilities coming coming into that and what that means for us. Sure. So right now we have an annual emissions reporting program that all of our largest facilities report their emissions to us every year. That includes bacteria pollutants like NOx and particulate matter, and toxics like hexavalent chromium, benzene, et cetera. They report their emissions to us every year. There's about 1,500 facilities, more or less, every year that report to us. That information is available on our FIND website. Uh, what the new uh, regulation from CAR, the Criteria Toxic Reporting Regulation, that came out of 8617. Uh, and this really expands the universe. We have about 28,000 permitted facilities. Uh, this, won't, this new regulation won't cover all of them, but it will cover well over half. At least that's what we're expecting right now. It will be phased in over a number of years uh, because it is such a large universe of facilities, but they will be reporting to us in this phase in through time. So we're expecting many, many more facilities uh, to report their emissions to us. Uh, there will be some simplified abbreviated reporting for the smallest facilities. Uh, but we're going to be uh, posting all this information again on fine as we collect it. We'll start getting it next year. And, and the rationale is to sort of wait and see how that's rolled out and see how uh, it implicates our fees. That's exactly right. We can expect to uh, hear about that in upcoming years when we're looking at the fees. Yes, yeah, so the, the timing probably won't work for our next budget cycle because they report uh, typically in March, or actually part of this, the amendment going to be extending that deadline because it's going to be such a new process for everybody will extend that by a couple months for the reporting. Uh, uh, so that'll miss the next year's budget cycle, but we'll bring it the following cycle. It's actually a pretty significant thing, I think, Chair. Yep. All right. Any other board member questions? Sujati, you have more to the presentation? All right. Uh, just the recommended action, Chair. Um, so uh, the recommended action uh, is to determine that proposed amendments to Reg 3 fees and Rule 1480 ambient monitoring and sampling of metal toxic air contaminants are exempt from CEQA. Uh, amend Reg 3 and Rule 1480. Uh, adopt executive officers for the 22-23 proposed goals and priority objectives and uh, find to adopt the fiscal year 22-23 draft budget. Very good. With that, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing portion of this and uh, we'll take public comment. First comments from Al Sattler. Al Sattler, go ahead. Okay, so um, I, looking through that presentation, um, I saw that you were it, it proposed deleting five air quality inspector positions. Uh, is this a good thing to do? Um, I, 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 you know, considering the number of um, complaints that can occur, um, de deleting um, inspectors is not a good thing to do at all, I would think. And I guess the other thing is I'm, I'm a little bit uh, um, confused as to why you would include a budget presentation together with a uh, change for um, uh, one of the rules um, for for um, metals. So I, I wasn't sure whether um, it violated some some rule or law to be um, pulling two 
and topics together in one agenda item. But that's that's for for you guys and the um, attorney to figure out and the council to figure out. But um, again, I want to speak in favor of not getting rid not getting rid of inspectors. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, I think it's Adrian Martinez from Earth Justice. It just says A Martinez, but I'm, I think I'm remembering that correctly. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair Benoit and members of the board. Um, my name is Adrian Martinez, and I'm here on behalf of Earth Justice. I um, want to thank staff for the presentation this morning and the board packet. One thing I want to flag that we have um, submitted comments on throughout is making sure that the planning and rules department is sufficiently staffed. We're still implementing rules from the 2016 air quality management plan. And um, as um, uh, Mr. Nastri noted today, there will be a new draft air plan released. There are a lot of proposed rules based on the control measure workshop that took place in November. So it's gonna take a lot of work to kind of get the regulations on the books to address a wide range of sources of pollution from stationary sources to area sources to um, indirect source rules. So I wanna, as um, staff is working to come back to the board at some point, I think it's important to make sure that the that part of the agency is sufficiently staffed and growing. Um, as far as revenue, we think there are other places that can be explored for revenue, making sure that toxics fees are fully assessed. Um, also looking at things like rule 317 fees. Um, you know, if the agency needs more funds to do its core work, I think there are places to look uh, to get that funding. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? Not seeing any hands raised, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing portion. Staff, do you want to respond to some of those questions? Sure. The challenge when we look at the budget is always a question of positions and resources, um, but it's also a question of our ability to do our jobs. And so one of the things that the deputies do in their evaluation of their operations is really try to assess where are the gaps right now and where do we need the most assistance? What positions can provide us immediate relief? And part of the challenge, particularly with enforcement and compliance is making sure that we have the wherewithal to do the data analysis. When we're getting a lot of complaints, we've got to go through and try to figure out where are they coming from? What's the nature of those complaints? How do we prioritize those against other complaints that we're receiving? And so in part, what this budget tried to do was to say, okay, let's provide some support on the analysis side for enforcement to try to uh, make sure that we're doing effective enforcement. Uh, and then we also have the ability to come back to the board for either mid-year adjustments. Part of the challenge that we have, frankly, um, this year is that, as you all know, we've had a tremendously high number of retirees. Over 80% of our staff has been in their current position for less than five years. So we need to make sure that we have people that are properly trained and just throwing bodies doesn't necessarily make us any faster. So we're trying to be smarter. We're trying to make sure that we've got the right people on board. And so from the perspective of where they see an elimination of positions, what we're actually doing is consolidating positions and bringing in uh, those analysts recognizing that we're gonna then come back later and try to get more personnel to see how we, again, be effective on the enforcement side. But that's a challenge that we face um, throughout the organization. It's one we're constantly looking at. As I was about to say, with um, Dr. Miyasato's departure, his announcement came very late in the process and we weren't able to actually incorporate uh, what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do, as uh, Dr. Miyasato so graciously said, when it takes two to replace one is we actually separate uh, science and technology advancement into two divisions, uh, which uh, Matt currently had overseen, but now we have two deputies for that. And so this budget, uh, unfortunately, didn't reflect that change, but we're gonna be coming back next month to actually incorporate the addition of a deputy executive officer for the technology advancement side. So these are some of the challenges that we have in the budget is just the timing of certain announcements and it's the assessment. 
but I would reassure the public that we in no way are lessening our focus on enforcement. We're in no way lessening that as a priority and making sure that we have the resources to do that. We're making sure that when we do bring people on board, that they're the right people that we need to do the job so that we can be more productive. And I'm just going to take a guess. These were vacant positions that were deleted, correct? They were open positions that had yet to be filled. And yeah. so that's part of why we go through the evaluation of does it make sense to do that? Or does it make sense to bring in other positions that will help us be more effective? Right. So we don't have five less inspectors. No. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure that was clarified. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And Bay, as far as bringing these items together, my understanding is that because the rule that we're adjusting is just we're adjusting just the CPI in that rule, correct? Yeah, this is typically how we do it. So, yeah. Okay. Was there any other questions that were in there? I think that was it. Uh, any other board member comments or questions on this item? All right, I'll take a motion. Approval of staff recommendations. Second, Mikel. Would the clerk go ahead and call the roll? Mayor Cacciotti? Yes. Supervisor Doe? Aye. Board member Krakow? Yes. Supervisor Kuehl? Yes. Mayor McAllen? Yes. Board member Padilla Campos? Absent. Supervisor Perez? Aye. Council member Rahman? Yes. Vice Mayor Richardson, absent. Mayor Rodriguez, absent. Supervisor Rutherford. She had to step out. She has a closed session uh, for a county business. Thank you, absent. Vice Chair Delgado. Yes. And Chair Benoit. Yes. Motion passes, nine, zero, four members absent. Very good. That brings us to our closed session. Before we go into closed session, I just want to again ask uh, or let our, our board members that aren't here know that they're missing a great day here at the uh, at the at the boardroom. Uh, as promised, donuts are here. Thank you, Vice Chair, for bringing those. Uh, I'd also like to uh, announce again that right outside we have our technology demonstration, and uh, I, again I got a moment to step out there. Can't wait to go out there again after closed session. Hopefully my board colleagues here will uh, take a moment to do that as well. So, again, our board members that are remote, I hope to see you here uh, soon in the next few meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. We need to go into closed session. So board members, please don't log off quite, quite yet. We're going to go into closed session. We'll be moving to CCA. Go ahead, Bay. Thank, Thank you. you. It is necessary for the board to recess to closed session pursuant to government code sections 54956.9 sub A and 54956.9 D1 to confer with its council regarding pending litigation, which has been initiated formally and to which the SCA QMD is a party. The actions are Cal Portland Company v. South Coast Air Quality Management District Governing Board of the South Coast Air Quality Management District and Wayne Nastry Executive Officer and Doe's 1 through 100 San Bernardino County Superior Court case number CIVDS 1925894. And it is also necessary for the board to recess to closed session pursuant to government code sections 54956.9 sub A and 54956.9 point nine d4 to consider initiation of litigation one case
A report of any reportable actions taken in closed session will be provided to the clerk of the board. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.